I've dedicated my entire career to public service, and I would not have it any other way. Uh, my goal was to get a good education so that I could break the cycle of poverty in my family. And not only that, but to come back and to give back to the community and serve as a role model to young men and women with backgrounds that were similar to mine. I went to law school because I wanted to become an attorney, not to make a whole lot of money, but so that I could empower and give a voice to the power of Ingrid Hill was one of the individuals that really changed my life because I come from a so-called poor, uh, disadvantaged, and underprivileged background. I was on a campus full of other students who were advantaged and who were privileged. But Ingrid Hill made all of us feel as though we could compete with on this, and on the same level as those individuals who were privileged and who were advantaged. So I learned to just strive to be the very best within whatever I did. And I felt that by being the best at what I did, that ultimately it would be rewarded and ultimately I could serve my community in the best capacity that I could. I strive to do my very best in the face of many, many obstacles, or as Ms. Ingrid Hill would say, I had a lot of baggage. But I strive to do my best despite the fact that I was the first person in my family to ever go to college, despite the fact that my mother had me at 15 years old, despite the fact that both of my parents never graduated from high school, despite the fact that my father was addicted to and drugs, my mother was and I was with, mentally Ill, with mental illness and probably reads on a second grade level, despite the fact that I went to bed hungry most nights because we didn't have food in the house. So when I stepped on the campus of Seton Hall University, I was a frightened and insecure little girl with big hopes and dreams. My senior year of high school, I was given the Black History Makers of the McDonald's. I was a finalist in the, Black, the McDonald's Black History Makers of Tomorrow contest. Uh, I never, beyond my wildest dreams, thought that I would actually be making history in my very own county, I became the, not to toot my own horn, but I became uh, the first African American assistant county counsel. Uh, I became the first African American to ever hold the constitutional office in the state of, in the county of the state of the county of the So that it doesn't matter what, where you come from. Today, the first day, uh, just like Kenyatta said, um, it's such an honor to be a judge in the city where you grew up. Uh, my desire to go to law school started when I was a freshman in high school. Uh, they raided my house while, while I was at a drama competition. My father at the time was not just using drugs, but he was selling drugs to support his habit. And on a Saturday morning, when I was out at a drama competition, they decided to raid my house. So they arrested my entire family. They arrested my, my father, they arrested my mother, they arrested my younger brother and sent him to the youth house. And so when I came home, I came home to an empty house. I found out from my neighbors what happened. But during that process, I can just recall my mother, uh, me staying home at 14 years old by myself. Somebody else could not explain how I felt. But I felt a sense of accomplishment and felt that I, I, you know, I accomplished things beyond what I thought that I could uh, accomplish. When I was appointed uh, by the city of Pasega as a municipal court judge, my goal was simply to ensure that everyone that appeared in that court was treated with courtesy, dignity, and respect, and to do individual justice and in individual cases to apply the law faithfully and fairly, and to temper each decision with patience and compassion and ensure that everyone was afforded due process under the law. As Kenyatta Stewart indicated, you know, the municipal court is the face of the judiciary. 
It is through the municipal courts that most citizens in the state come into contact with the judicial system, since most individuals will never appear before any other court. It is from their experience in the municipal court system that form the basis of their perception about the equality of justice in New Jersey. So I took and I continue to take this responsibility very seriously. More than three decades ago, uh, Chief Justice Vanderbilt stated, the wearing of a judicial robe is important in part because it reminds all concerns of the fact that the judge represents the law on which liberty depends. The robe is even more significant as a constant reminder to the judge that he does not have the freedom of the ordinary individual, but is himself bound to submerge his personal feelings and the impartial administration of the law. The judicial robe is a constant reminder to the magistrates that, that they, like other judges, are subject, are subject to the canons of judicial ethics as rules of court. It is not enough that a judge be honest and impartial. It is essential that he has the reputation in his community for being a man of absolute integrity, whose judgment the is world not open on Tuesday, March 4th. I am, a, I am confident that I have accomplished the goals that I set out to accomplish, and based on all of the support that you have shown me, these past two months, I believe that I can say all that I have demonstrated you in this room, all of you, all of the individuals who are not here, you have turned a situation that could really have been demoralizing, you've turned it into a situation of triumph, empowerment, and inspiration. Thank you and God bless. The People's Organization for Progress. The Community Youth Leadership Council, the United African Movement, the Brothers Organization, Team Charity, and the Forsake Chapter of the NACP, we present the Honorable Judge Karen Brown for your outstanding contribution. You came back on the 14th, uh, the 21st was canceled, came back on the 14th, came back on, uh, don't forget, on the 18th, she became county clerk. She ran for county clerk and won. We, we have been just watching John Curry bully the candidates on a regular basis. You know, he would put a candidate in place and then he controls them and tells them what to do. But Judge Karen Brown wasn't like a regular candidate. When she won the county clerk's position, John Curry came in, the bully that he is, and told her, we're going to staff your office with this deputy clerk and this person is going to be in your office. And she said, no such thing is going to happen. She won that election and she picked her own staff. And, and so that made me want to champion her cause from that point on to see somebody stand up to John Curry. That's unheard of. No candidate, the congressman, none of them don't stand up to him. But she did. So I'm, I'm asking you to spread the word. Tuesday, March 4th, 6.45 p.m. Please come into Passaic City Council Chambers to stand up for somebody who has stood up for all of your family members in this community from here to past. We must start to network with, we, with each other. Whether you live in Newark, whether you live in Patterson, wherever you live at. If a candidate is running and start to <laughs> and, and not just talking about it. Everybody know me. If I get behind you, I'm running in the streets, I'm knocking on doors, I'm doing whatever you need me to do. Because I know how important it is to have somebody in leadership, in elected position, to represent us. You're not going to realize how important Judge Brown is to us when she's gone. You don't miss your water for the well one drop. Right. But when you start going before Judge Irwin, go <laughs> for them, I'm going to drop you in there for a bobo. <laughs> <laughs> and it's off to the county jail with you. Back to slavery. So it is what it is. You've got to appreciate what you have while you have them in your midst. 